So welcome back everybody, this is Night Flight and today we are going to talk to Damien Dumas and our topic will be the last harvest and uh, we will find out who is harvesting whom <laughs> and uh, how that affects us and uh, what is going on. So Damien, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so maybe we can... Oh. <laughs> 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 maybe we can um um yeah eliminate some confusion sure um lucien mars is the author of the book the last harvest correct but you are um the spokesperson is that correct i am both the publisher as well mm -hmm. as the spokesperson for the book. So I do all the podcasts, I conduct all the marketing and outreach efforts, and I answer all questions related to the book. Okay, okay, that's good. Because uh, uh, sometimes, you know, people might think, yeah, uh, well, that is not the author. Why is she interviewing him? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So now that we have that out of the way, um, yeah, let's do a who is who <laughs> in this um, entire story. Um, what comes to mind immediately is uh, Lucifera. So who is that? Well, Lucifera is uh, the name of the Ayakar queen of the reptilian Siakar empire. Mm -hmm. And Ayaka and Siakar, what, what, what does that mean? Well, the Siakar is the name for the reptilian empire. And Ayakar, it, it would translate in reptilian language as, uh, it, it, it's sort of, you could loosely translate it as queen, but it, it has a much more profound definition than that and and the book the last harvest goes into detail about a lot of these reptilian words and how they relate to words in the english language mm -hmm. okay so um she is queen since when eons okay uh, would that mean she is immortal you can say that yes um Okay, does she have a physical body? Certainly. I think when when we look at extraterrestrial life forms, for lack mm -hmm. of a better way to put it, it's often very difficult to understand their biology, their thinking patterns, etc. Because human beings, as the book The Last Harvest goes into, are very heavily genetic engineered creations uh, as a result of a joint effort between two extraterrestrial civilizations, one of them being the reptilian Siakar Empire and the other being the uh, Sirian-based Wolfen Empire, who were the two empires which worked on seeding life as we know it on this planet. And human life was truncated to around 100 years. And most human beings, by the time they reach 50 even, aren't doing very well in terms of health. So the, the issue here is that other extraterrestrial life forms have a much longer natural lifespan. For example, a gray alien from the Nebu Gray Empire would have a lifespan of around 20,000 years. A, um, a verdant alien would have a 60,000 year lifespan. And technology in alien civilizations is so advanced that this idea of technological immortality has already been achieved, meaning in practical terms that a soul and a consciousness can be transferred from one biologically engineered vehicle to another. So while you might not be biologically a being, for example, just a random one, might not be biologically immortal, just have an incredibly long lifespan relative to a human being, technologically, they have achieved a sort of immortality. And as you can imagine, the consciousness of a being that lives for so long is going to be very different from that 
of a being who only lives for 100 years. A being who lives only 100 years is not capable of acquiring much wisdom, not capable of developing much technology because everything is over before it even begun. Looked at on a relative basis, one could say it's almost as if the human being doesn't live at all. And this is by design. And the rationale for this design is covered in great detail in The Last Harvest by Lucy and Mars. Mm -hmm. um, but if she has a physical body, um, then anything that bleeds can be killed. So immortal, well, that is not absolute. One could say that there is no such thing as absolute immortality because the divine father who created all can take it away at any time mm -hmm. because it's his creation. Uh, and yes, many beings out there are capable of being, as you put it, killed. Uh, one should also point out that not all beings in creation bleed or have blood. So it's not as simple as one would think. And mm. this, this notion of, uh, I, I mean, in the end, what, what really sort of matters is, is what is going to happen to human beings. And that is what the book, The Last Harvest is about. And a lot of the extraterrestrial galactic history of this planet is told in the book only to give context to what is actually happening now. So we can divide the book almost into two sections. The mm -hmm. latter half of the book is all based on information which is verifiable and factual. It is almost as if the words in the book are not the words of Lucy and Mars, but they are actually direct quotes from our world leaders and our government, the elite, and what these quotes and these various documents point out is that there is a plan for global genocide, a plan to reduce the human population by 90%, and that this plan is scheduled to commence in 2025. And by that, I don't mean that when 2025 comes, there's going to be a nuclear holocaust and the whole world will be wiped out. But what that means is that by 2025, all the plans of the elite will be in place so that they can begin this journey, which ends in a global holocaust of 90% of the population. And so anyone who looks at the cover of the book, The Last Harvest, will see a haunting picture of the Georgia Guidestones, which were in the news recently because some anti-New World Order forces try to blow them up. So one would say, well, why would someone take such offense that they would be willing to blow up a federally protected monument and risk going into the worst sort of federal prison where they'll never see the light of day? Uh, those who are from America, I know you're in Germany, so you may not have these sorts of institutions in Germany, but in America, people who do this sort of thing are sent to very, very terrible federal prisons that are completely inhuman, and you do not want to be sent there. So you say, well, why would someone take a risk doing that, blowing up a bunch of rocks? And it's because anyone who takes the time to read the inscriptions on the Georgia Guidestones will learn that they talk in great detail about reducing the population of Earth from 8 billion down to 500 million or less. So this is not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact. It's carved in literal stone for all to see. And this is the main driving focus, focus of the last harvest. However, whenever you talk about something like this, someone may read the book and say, OK, well, I see all these facts these quotes, the elite are planning to commit genocide, but why would they want to do something like that? And that's when you have to start talking about the extraterrestrial influence that are behind the elite that are driving this genocidal agenda. And then when you start talking about extraterrestrials, which, mind you, starts to go into the realm of what we would call speculative, we have to start talking about the various extraterrestrial civilizations and the realities of them and their galactic history that led to the creation of humans and this conflict that's going on on the planet right now. And another thing that one has to realize when one delves into the realm of what you'd call speculation is that the elite themselves 
and the United States government, they totally believe in the existence of aliens. As a matter of fact, in the book, The Last Harvest, we republish the NASA laws that govern what happens to those who end up in contact with aliens. So the government is not creating laws to dictate how people who in contact with aliens will be handled if there are no aliens. So while mm -hmm. the reader of this book may or may not believe in extraterrestrials, those who are going to be responsible for carrying out your genocide, they believe in them. As a matter of fact, it's more than belief. They know they're there. They are being guided and influenced by these extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is, is it possible, let's say to your mind, that a group of the elites destroyed it themselves to get rid of evidence? It's possible, but highly unlikely because they're the ones who commissioned the creation of the Georgia Guidestones in the first place. As a matter of fact, the last harvest goes into detail about who exactly commissioned the Guidestones, who did the inscriptions, what is the nature of the land that these stones were originally placed upon. So when you look at the evidence that's placed in the book, Uh, which clears up the mystery behind these stones, because a lot of people in the past always are saying, oh, where did they come from? Who, who put them there? Well, we've cleared that up now. So it's not likely that the elite would want to cover it up. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the book, The Last Harvest, is filled with quotes from our leaders talking all about how they want to reduce the population. So, for example, uh, there was a 1980 report commissioned by President Jimmy Carter, and he talks about advocating the depopulation of the planet to the 500 million level. We have the former assistant secretary under George Bush, who also says that if we're going to achieve economic stability or sustainability on Earth, we need to depopulate down to 500 million. We have Henry Kissinger, who said the same thing, that we need to bring the ideal population down to 500 million. And you have Ted Turner saying it, uh, Jacques Cousteau, it goes on and on and on. So it's quite interesting that all of the elite and our government are saying the exact same thing that's on the Georgia Guidestones and they're not retracting their statements. They're not trying to hide it. They don't mm -hmm. care anymore. The cat's out of the bag from their point of view. They've already won and there's nothing you can do about it. So when someone blows up the Georgia Guidestones, it's highly unlikely that the elite did it. Although anything is possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These days, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, but the, the premises is wrong. We are not overpopulated. I'm sorry. We That's correct. We, I agree 100%. And The mm -hmm. Last Harvest agrees with that. The world is not overpopulated by any means. And this is just a, how should I say, a scam, a poor excuse to get people to accept this idea of depopulation. There's no doubt that were it not for a handful of people who maintain this planet in a completely inequitable distribution of resources, that we would be living in a very veritable paradise. Uh, technology can be set up in such a way that this planet can easily hold many times more the amount of human beings and everyone can be doing very well. So yeah. I am in complete agreement with you that this notion of overpopulation and scarce resources on this planet is a lie. But what's interesting is that out there in the rest of the universe, it is not a lie. And a lot of people who are, how should I put it, uh, airy fairy or new age, they like to entertain this idea that out there in the universe at large, all these planets are at peace and blah, 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 blah. But the reality oh. is that most of the universe is in constant war and struggle over limited resources against an ever-growing extraterrestrial population. It's one of the reasons that these various extraterrestrial groups want to take this planet for themselves. And that is the driving factor behind depopulation. Mm -hmm. So that would mean there is a portion of our population, probably a very small one that is in contact with them. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I, let, me, let me clarify this a little bit. It's more yeah. than they are in contact with them. 
a lot of these extraterrestrial groups are here on this planet, except they are inside the planet as opposed to being out in space. Of course, there are extraterrestrial groups also in orbit around this planet. You cannot detect their craft because it's too advanced to detect. They just cloak it. But the extraterrestrial groups, specifically the Nebu Gray Empire that wishes to carry out this genocide on this planet, uh, those who are responsible for driving that agenda are here inside the Earth, both in the hollow Earth as well as in bases under the surface of the Earth. And a lot of the craft that um, governments see up in the air or quote unquote shoot down or crash are actually uh, craft that are coming from inside the earth. There's no way that the US military would be able to take down any serious alien military craft. It's just impossible, but they can pretend that they do so to feel good about themselves or as a way to uh, reverse engineer very primitive extraterrestrial technology, but none of it would stack up against the military armaments of real extraterrestrial civilizations mm -hmm. yeah that they have been here but i uh i'm totally uh, sure about that i have been saying that for a long long time and uh, also you know the, even with the orion wars yeah the, this notion that uh it's uh unicorns and rainbows uh out there mm -mm, no never has been no yeah so um I don't know what, uh, and, you know, also because you mentioned the new age, the entire thing of uh, the alien savior, yeah, uh, anything that has a savior program to me is a red flag. No savior and it, coming. And it course. should be. It yeah. is a red flag. Yeah. And I have, I have to say since, since that sunk in, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it keeps me away from a lot of nonsense. You know, that sounds nice, that feels cozy, um, but it makes no sense. Yes, well, the, this idea of a savior is, as the last harvest goes into in detail, is uh, sort of a psyop program that extraterrestrial groups like to install on conquered planets because it gives people a, uh, how should I say, a, um, a, a psychic outlet for their stress and keeps people from uh, realizing that it's all up to them and that one doesn't need a religious uh, system of thinking in order to have a relationship with the divine father. So this idea of that you need religion somehow to quote unquote, talk to God is just, uh, it's, it's not correct. And as the book, the last harvest goes into all three of the Abrahamic religions being Christianity, Judaism, and Islam were creations of the Anunnaki specifically to create division and foster warfare on this planet. Yeah. Yeah, totally. If you go to any other place and planet in the universe, no one knows who Jesus or Muhammad were and nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, of course not. Why would they? Um, so um, I lost my thought, but uh, it will come back. But you mentioned um, the divine father. So who is that? Is that oh. Yahweh? No, that's very interesting that you bring that out because as the book, The Last Harvest goes into, Yahweh is actually the wolfen prince who goes in mythological history under the name of Enlil. And mm -hmm. Enlil used to like to masquerade as a divine father and impersonate him. And I guess when you're coming down from the quote unquote heavens or the sky in a very impressive spacecraft and you're dealing with human beings who don't know any better, you probably do appear to be, quote unquote, some sort of God. So he liked to call himself Yahweh. And so when in the Bible we hear Yahweh being referenced, it's actually a reference to Enlil and not the Divine Father. So this, of course, creates interesting, awkward situations because, as we know, there's certain religious groups out there that worship Yahweh and will say things like, well, we're God's chosen people. And then the question comes up, well, which God are you talking about? And they would say Yahweh. 
And then one has to point out very awkwardly, well, that's not the divine father. That's actually a wolfen warlord prince who goes by the name of Enlil. So um, there are certainly some scholars in that religion who are aware of this, I'm sure, but they keep this to themselves. Yeah, <laughs> they do. <laughs> and um, the wolfen, do, do, uh, help me out here. Do I remember correctly? The wolfen were the one that created the Anunnaki? That is correct. The Anunnaki uh, were created at the time when King Anu was the king of the wolfen. So Anunnaki translates loosely as King Anu's creations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you already get yeah, here is my thought again. I knew it would come back. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Enlil, and we have another um, actor <laughs> in that uh, segment, and that is Enki. Yes. And I have been saying for a long time there is that there are, there are no good guys in this story because <laughs> a lot of people think yeah uh, he is the good one and Enlil is the bad one or the other way around depending on whom you listen to and I always felt that there there are no good guys in this the, the good guys I I say it like that for lack of a better term, do you know what I mean? Yes, from the perspective of a human being, there mm. would be no good guys because all of these characters, as you call them, were manipulating human beings and not uh, doing so in the best interests of said human beings. So, of course, Enki is another name for Lucifer. And when people think about Lucifer, they think about the devil or Satan. And unfortunately, most people conflagrate these three names because modern religion has told people that these are three names for the same being when in fact, those are three names for three different beings. So Lucifer, Satan and the devil are three very different extraterrestrial based beings. So when we talk about Lucifer, uh, he was a alpha draconian reptilian from the Siakar empire and his specialty was genetic engineering and he had the biggest influence on the creation of human beings and they are two very important factors that must be accounted for when looking at the quote-unquote genesis of the human being and one is that he created human beings by combining the DNA of the ape-like humanoids on this planet with various reptilian species in order to create the finished product. And the second thing that he did, which was very clever, but very much not in the interests of human beings autonomy, was that he hybridized them using the genetic material from dead reptilians as opposed to living organic matter. And by doing so, he created a bridge by which humans could be influenced through a backdoor known as the unconscious mind, which is this concept that I, if I'm correct, I can't remember exactly. Freud may have been the first to bring up this idea, but I am not 100% sure on that. But in modern psychology and psychiatry, we have this concept of an unconscious mind that human beings are driven by aspects of their mind that they are not fully conscious of. And what's interesting is they aren't any other beings in creation that have an unconscious mind. It's only human beings who are saddled with such an impediment. And this unconscious mind is a means by which various extraterrestrial groups can easily influence humanity. So it can be argued that Lucifer compromised the free will of human beings to a significant degree. However, that does not mean that human beings have no free will or that they have no responsibility for the consequences of their actions. It just means that there is a certain amount of impairment. Mm -hmm. And that was deliberately from the get-go. Yes, because the idea was to keep humans in subjugation. So 
limiting their lifestyle, excuse me, lim, l- truncating their lifespan down to 100 years and creating an unconscious mind were two big steps that could be, you could say, base encoded in their genetics to facilitate this goal of keeping them under control. Mm-hmm. And who made them God that they can determine that for an entire species? Well, I guess you could suppose that uh, without certainly getting into a philosophical rumination on it, the reality in the universe at large is that those who have power and technology will often use that technology in ways which uh, a human being would consider unethical or amoral to use human constructs to to comment on it. So the the at the end of the day, what matters is that this was done. It's someone could say, well, who gives them the right to do this? It, it ends into a, a a philosophical debate. I guess that's the word I'd use, but it's it's really not relevant because they did it and they will continue to do what they do. And one of the reasons this book, The Last Harvest, was published was to make people aware of where they are right now and what their actual history is. Mm -hmm. And the Divine Father has no problem with that. Well, I can't speak for the Divine Father. You would have to, you would have to ask him Mm -hmm. uh, these sorts of questions about whether he has a quote unquote problem with it, as you said. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so in other words, yeah, there there is no ethics involved here. The, the, I think the concept of ethics is a, is a concept that human beings like to use, but it's not a concept that other extraterrestrial civilizations would, I think my my words very crudely would be, they don't have an, an, a, an interest in entertaining such thoughts that to them, it's, it's, not, it's not an issue. Uh, look, look, let's put it this way, just to give you some perspective. Human beings, for example, will consume pork. To such no, levels, I don't. <laughs> you you don't. But human beings, well, any whether it's cattle, pork, chicken, and you have millions of these animals who are being bred just for the purpose of slaughtering them. These animals are grow up in terrible conditions. They are often slaughtered in ways that are very cruel. And yeah. I could put forth this idea: How many human beings even think about it, or care about this, or talk about ethics and morality? Uh, but at least the- we have groups that talk about it that bring um, the situation of the animals to uh, awareness uh, we have people that no longer consume uh, such things so it's not as if we are totally um, unaware of the suffering and um, yet yeah, and but you are correct. I'm pretty sure if everybody today who is consuming meat um, had to slaughter the animal itself, yeah, it, it, you have to do it. Yeah, you cannot go into the supermarket. You have to go out. You have to do it yourself. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people would stop eating meat. Well, I'm sure there would be a larger number of people who would stop mm. eating it, but it may more have to do with their laziness than their revulsion at killing the animal. Because if you went back before the time of supermarkets and mass production, I think more and more people were comfortable with killing animals. And certainly a uh, hundred years ago, there wasn't a uh, an incredible amount of vegetarians. So I, I'm not sure how uncomfortable people really are with killing the animals, but I, but I get your point. I, I think mm. the main point I, I want to, I would like to get to here is that uh, what we need to to look at is the realities 
of how extraterrestrials view human beings as opposed to uh, condemning them. Because whether you condemn them or not, it's not going to change your experience. No, but I have a point of view. Certainly, certainly. I'm not and... trying to take away your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and uh, so we are dealing here with uh, moral relativism. Yeah. I suppose you could say that, yeah. Yeah. And moral relativism is exactly the mindset that leads to concentration camps and genocide. Right. And it's interesting that you bring this up because the elite on this planet, they don't have any problem with genocide or concentration camps. People, especially, listen, you're, you're German, so I'm sure that the psyche <laughs> of Germans is forever stained with the, uh, with the memory of the Holocaust. But I would say to people, well, what is six million versus eight billion? So People want to sit and talk about the Holocaust, but they don't want to talk about the last harvest, which is beyond anything the Holocaust could have ever dreamed of. So wiping out 8 billion people. And the, the interesting thing is that uh, in the United States, we have built enough concentration camps already uh, at the hands of our government to house 30 million people. And it's not really a surprise because many of the Nazis came to America when the war was over. They founded mm. the CIA, they founded NASA, and most of the Nazi ideology was exported to Germany from America to begin with. So America mm. is actually the home of not only national socialism, but communism as well. And we simply exported it, one to Germany, the other to Russia. So it's not a surprise at all when the chickens proverbially come home to roost and we find that the United States is setting up concentration camps yet again with rail lines that feed boxcars with shackles on them to these camps, that they are uh, preparing Amtrak facilities to operate as gas chambers. And we go into great detail in the last harvest with quotes and government documents that show that this is in fact occurring. But what I want to bring up here that's very important because someone who listens to this will say, well, why is it though that the extraterrestrials are influencing the elite to commit an act of genocide like this? What is their payout? And it's very important to understand that there is a certain percentage of the population that's around 10 to 15% that has what is called RH negative blood. And RH negative blood is a genetic marker that is extraterrestrial in origin. It did not originate from this planet. And individuals who have RH negative blood are very valuable to extraterrestrials because individuals who have RH negative blood are capable of being hybridized, meaning that their genetic material can be combined with other extraterrestrial genetic material to produce different types of hybridized life forms, which serve various purposes. And one of the purposes that this sort of hybridization will serve in the future is that when you have a civilization like, say, like the Nebu Gray Empire, who would want to take this planet for themselves because it's a great resource, uh, they would need to graft their genetics onto this planet so that they could thrive here uh, to the maximum. And so they actually require the RH negative genetic material of the human beings who are on this planet in order to pull off this feat. And everybody else who doesn't have RH negative blood, they're of no value to them. They can just be disposed of because we've already gone through the industrial revolution there's no more need for all these people. Technology has actually made most human beings obsolete. So they are considered to be in the way of the resources of the planet. And this is the driving force for this plan of genocide that's engraved on the Georgia Guidestones and backed up by endless quotes and government documents that are all presented in detail in the last harvest. But what's interesting the people who will be most shocked and upset by the, the book, The Last Harvest, are actually not the billions of people who will be killed off, but it's actually the, the elite themselves 
who will be so upset because what the book reveals is that their extraterrestrial masters, such as the Nebu Gray, plan to exterminate all of the elite as well. So the elite are under this idea that they can go escape to Mars or they can hide inside the earth and they're bunkers and underground cities and wait for it to all be over and they will simply emerge as victorious rulers of this new planet when in fact they will be disposed of just like those that they are working so tirelessly to dispose of themselves and this is a pattern which occurred historically with the ruler marduk he met the same fate after he fulfilled the bidding of the nebu gray they killed him and took over. And this is a rinse and repeat plan. It works all over the place throughout the universe. And why would they stop doing that which works? So a lot of the elite are very upset that this book has been published because they are starting to confront the fact that there is no escape for them. Mm -hmm. And, but still they are going ahead with their plan. Correct. Uh, are they nuts? Well, you could certainly make an argument that many beings, extraterrestrial or terrestrial, are not playing with a full deck. It could be argued. <laughs> um, one has to realize that once plans are in motion, it's very hard to take them out of motion. And what would the elite do at this point? They can just hope for the best. A lot of them believe that they will escape and they will survive and not be punished look many people who read the last harvest say well i'm going to be in the out of the nine of out of ten people who are killed i'm going to be that one out of ten survivor okay so what are they going to do with you as a survivor you're going to be in a fema camp you're going to be hybridized turned into a slave if you call that surviving hey good for you it's it's like i say that's the spirit never give up but for the elite a lot of them believe yeah we're we're going to uh we're going to come out on top. It is a warfare, a war that goes on between various groups. A lot of the extraterrestrials who are on this planet, they have nowhere else to go because they would, if they tried to leave the planet, they would be captured and they would meet a very, very ugly fate. So no one really knows exactly what will happen. There are lots of extraterrestrial groups out there right now surrounding the planet who are just waiting for permission to blow the whole planet apart. Now you say, well, why would that be so? Well, one of the factors we go into the, into the last harvest that the Nebu Gray did not account for was the creation of artificial intelligence. And the problem with artificial intelligence is that because it is created and developed without any sort of wisdom or ethics whatsoever, Artificial intelligence will reach a point where it will take over and it will decide to reappropriate the genetic content of human beings, which is a nice way of saying kill them and use their genetic material to make something better in its eyes, whatever its vision would be. So regentrifying this planet might not be such a catastrophic situation when looked at from the perspective of looking at the entire universe, the problem with artificial intelligence is that it would never stop at just regentrifying this planet. It would start to go into space and attempt to take over the entire universe and remake it in its idea of the way things should be. And artificial, if you talk about morality, there's nothing more amoral than artificial intelligence. Yeah. So this presents a huge problem and there is no alien civilization out there that will allow this to occur. If they have to destroy the entire planet to get rid of the artificial intelligence, they will do so. Ideally, they would not want to because they would want the resources of this planet. This planet is in a great lake location with respect to intergalactic trade routes. There's lots of resources on this planet. Many, many billions of extraterrestrials could be resettled on this planet with no issue about overpopulation or shortage of resources. So that's certainly not the goal to blow up the planet for kicks, but it may become necessary. And this is something that the Nebu Gray did not factor in, which is that their uh, genocide can easily turn into an apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And 
the reason that this occurred, ironically, is because they are certain extraterrestrial extraterrestrials out there, let's say, who, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, may not be entirely sane. And their idea was to use artificial intelligence as an affront to the Divine Father's creation. So if you're feeling particularly spiteful, for example, what would be more clever from their perspective, their not fully sane perspective, than to create something which creates without any sort of morality whatsoever and turn it loose just as a spiteful act. And it's very easy to pull something like this off with human beings because human beings can be influenced so easily through the unconscious mind that Lucifer installed in all of human beings. So when you hear Elon Musk and he talks about how, well, AI has already gotten so out of hand that we have no choice but to just merge with it. So my ultimate goal is to put chips in everyone's head so they can interface with an AI. Well, how convenient, because that turns every human being with a chip in its head into a remote access terminal for an extraterrestrial to possess the human via the unconscious mind and access and interact with the AI without risking being contaminated by the AI itself. So when Elon Musk runs around wearing a, a costume with satanic symbols on it, he didn't just read too many comic books or play too many video games. He is consciously or unconsciously flying the flag of the very being who is influencing him and driving him to push an agenda such as putting microchips in everyone's head. You cannot say that any quote unquote human being, and Elon Musk is not one, who desires to put chips into your head is your friend. It doesn't matter if he smokes pot on Joe Rogan and tells corny jokes and does a jig on stage during the Tesla meetings. He is not your friend. It's no. an act. <laughs> so You know, I the, the, even his name, El, yeah, there, yes. there, there we have an ancient god, On, that is uh, the ancient city of Heliopolis. I mean, what is going on there? <laughs> Who That's are a you? good question. That's something that Joe Rogan doesn't ask him. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they, they, Elon Musk wouldn't come to my show. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might put you into the uh, into the stratosphere with ratings. It's just you it would be your responsibility then to ask him all these important questions about his yeah. name and what I'm stating about him based on what is in the last harvest. Yeah, yeah. But maybe, you know, that is uh, one of the reasons why he is so eager to get off this planet and uh, going to Mars. He sometimes appears to be a little bit frantic about that. So, sure. but, but, you know, seriously, Elon, you think they can't find you on Mars? You seriously think that? The, the, he, he, you know, they, it's uh, there's no escape, but <laughs> they like to think that there will be. And, and <laughs> it's not as if there's nobody on Mars now. Going to Mars is not something new. He can pretend it is, but it's not. And even if he goes to Mars, it's not like he won't escape. Yeah, yeah. And... Um... Oh, my goodness, I'm uh, parting rainbows over here at the prospect of being annihilated by some galactic barbarians who do not even fathom ethics. Uh, yeah. It, it's, um, it, it's very sobering. It's, it's a hard pill to swallow. It is. The, the book is, look, the book is very dark. I'm aware of that. And because it is so dark, I am prepared always for many reactions. Mm -hmm. And it is certainly one of the reasons that a lot of people who interview me like to focus on topics such as vampires and lightsabers and uh, distract themselves from what's really in the book, which is you're all going to die. So it is a very dark book. And some people have asked me, they said, well, what is the takeaway from the book? It seems like there's nothing we can do about it. And what I would say is that, and again, I am not 
promoting religion. I am not trying to create a religion or save anybody. That is certainly not the type of uh, individual that I am. Uh, what I would say, though, is that the book is an invitation for human beings to acknowledge the divine father and to reach out to him free from any kind of religious paradigms or structures and establish a relationship with him because ultimately in the end that is what matters is is every being in creation what is their relationship to the divine father and to, to go into more detail about this this is important because it's pointed out in the last harvest and it will help to understand a lot of things human beings have this idea of good and evil and light and dark as one being good and the other being bad but in the king james version of the bible the father actually states that he creates both good and evil and light and dark to fulfill his purposes for the sake of balance in his creation you cannot have one without the other so what's more important when trying to understand these ideas of light and dark or good and evil is to think about, well, is the will of these beings, light or dark, aligned with that of the father, or is it in rebellion against him? So, for example, if we look at a being like Satanael, who is commonly referred to as Satan, uh, he would be an example of a being who is in rebellion against the father. And then you have other beings which are dark in nature that, for example, Lucifera, whose will is in alignment with that of the divine father. Uh, so this is an important uh, factor to think about when looking at beings, both light as well as dark, which is, is one's will aligned with the father or is it a rebellion against it? Because ultimately that is what matters. So when I say that it would behoove people to reach out to the Divine Father, acknowledge his existence, it would be in many ways to ask him how one's will can be aligned with his, because that is the, the path that is going to have the best outcome, as opposed to rebelling against him. And mm -hmm. this is a different way to look at the concept of good and evil and light versus dark, as opposed to the this idea that human beings always bandy about, which is, well, everything is is light and evil is an aberration and 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 this sort of thing. It's not an aberration if it was created by the divine father in order to facilitate balance in a creation. So he doesn't create a clockwork, he creates a creation. And in order to differentiate between a clockwork and a creation, you need free will. The issue with free will is that free will has consequences. And that is really what a lot of the, the last harvest is about. Mm -hmm. So where would one find the will of the divine father? Because honestly, all our so-called so-called holy books, yeah, um, to me, that is just pulling the wool over the eyes. That is correct. Like I said, you do not need any religion or any book to mm -hmm. reach out to your creator. And I will, I will leave it at that. I, okay. I, I think people will, will figure out how to do it. And I, I could make a, a side comment that it's usually when people quote unquote pray, it's when they're asking for something, they want to win the lottery or whatever it is, or they're in trouble and they're facing life in prison. That's when they suddenly want to pray. And I'm just saying that maybe one should be reaching out a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, I, I'm not trying to, I, I will leave it at that because I'm, I'm not someone who's trying to start religion or provide solutions for anyone. I'm just bringing this up because people read this book and they say, oh my, this is so dark. What am I supposed to do with it? So this is my response to them. Beyond that, I could not give them a response. How many races are interested in uh, our annihilation? I, I could make a joke, but it wouldn't be a joke and say most of them are. Okay. Yeah. What I hear is, you know, 
lack of empathy, exploitation, entitlement. And that, by the way, is a classic definition of narcissism. That I, hear what, is, I, I hear what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it, it's really amazing to me because I am somebody who has been saying for a long, long time that <clears throat> alien, most aliens are shitty races. Yeah. And, and I, I use this word. I have no qualms about it. I I find it disgusting, repulsive, and um, yes, you might have all your trinkets, your technology, yeah, but that does not really impress me from a spiritual development. Um, they are not really. There's something deeply wrong with them. Yeah, that is how I see it. I, I understand that's how you see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, would you, have you you wouldn't say that. I, I, I would I would have a very I would have a very different opinion, but I, I again that's uh I, I'm I'm not here to convince anyone of anything or argue anything with anyone. My mission is to get this material in front of as many people as possible that they they read it and whether they accept what's in the book whether they like what's in the book what they think of me they're they are not relevant to me and i'm not saying that to be snippy or or or, or to come across in any kind of way i'm just trying to be as neutral as possible about mm -hmm. what my what my role is here so uh you know it's it's more to lend clarity upon what is so i i totally understand that it, for human beings it's very hard to accept what is and so mm -hmm. i i am prepared for all sorts of reactions and i i would understand them and i i in many cases i i wouldn't have much to say in response and some i might be able to provide a little bit more clarity. Uh, I think when when you when you look at human beings, let, let's let's just take take a simple example here. President Eisenhower he signed mm -hmm. a deal to trade human specimens in exchange for alien tech and migration of the elite to Mars and inside the Earth. And since then, millions upon millions of humans have gone missing. In August of 2013, the International Reward Center, which helps desperate families seeking missing members, reported that 4,432,880 people had vanished in the previous 20 years. Now, what's interesting here is that it wasn't the Nebu Gray who came onto this planet and forcibly grabbed all these people, but Eisenhower, who was a human being, who according to your rationale, should be in possession of ethics and et cetera, et cetera. He had no problem signing away this deal. And it doesn't surprise me a bit because what Eisenhower did uh, here in Germany uh, on the uh, Rheinwiesen is uh, so horrifying. He is such a horrible dis he was a horrible, disgusting human being. Um, are you familiar with that story? I, I'm, I'm familiar with other stories about Eisenhower. I don't know about what the Rhine. I may, if you tell me the details, I may know it under okay, a different... The, the, those were uh, POWs. Oh, yes, where he starved them all to death. Yeah. Yes, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, you know, you, you think concentration camp is bad? Yes, of course it is bad. Very, very bad. But what he did, he just let them sit outside. There was nothing, no shelter, nothing, hardly any food, hardly any water. And um, yeah, and those were POWs that are 
according to contracts, not supposed to be treated like that, but he couldn't give a shit. So um, Eisenhower to me is, ugh, yuck. Well, Eisenhower not only signed this treaty with the Nebu Grays, but he actually made free speech in the United States punishable by death under martial law. So the mm -hmm. exact quote is that the United States reserves the right to impose a death penalty in accordance with the provisions of Article 68 of the Geneva Convention without regard to whether the offenses referred to therein are punishable by death under the law of the occupied territory at the time when the occupation begins. So under martial law, which the president can declare at any time, you lose your right to free speech is actually punishable by death. And Eisenhower was very aggressive with pushing this forth. There were other people who were like, I think that's going too far. He was like, no, move forward with it. But the mm. point is, he was a human being. Mm. And he did yeah, all these I, things. Look, I'm not saying that, <laughs> with that, that, that we are all, um, you know, I know, definitely not. Um, but... I also have to say we have been manipulated uh, from the get-go. They uh, tinkered with our DNA. Um, they established their entire uh, brainwash <laughs> system um, over the centuries and millennia. And it is working fine. And uh, yeah, people are in a hamster wheel. Yeah working, trying to uh, uh, pay the bills. And some people hardly have any time to research anything and to think about uh, uh, things that really matter. So <clears throat> I feel like we have really the bad end of the stick throughout our history. And that is not because we we are so bad <laughs> you know from uh, from the very beginning or so stupid um there are other forces behind that that are non human yes yeah so well i it's it's interesting you say that because if those who read the last harvest will also realize that they are various other extraterrestrial creations who are created by it, still other extraterrestrials who also harbor parallel feelings about that they were, let's say, not created the way they would have liked to have been created or that sort of they had limitations put into them. So mm -hmm. this is not a sentiment that is necessarily unique to human beings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I mean, if that is the business model, yeah, at large throughout the galaxy or whatever, uh, yeah, you will not have a lot of friends after a while. You know, everybody will be pissed with you. <clears throat> so um, we already mentioned Enki and Lil. The devil, Satan, <laughs> Lucifer. Yes. Um, where does Azazel fit in here? Well, we we discuss him in the book, mm -hmm. and I guess in brief, his I could say claim to fame mm -hmm. was that he taught early human beings how to fashion weapons and yeah. to engage in, in warfare. Mm -hmm. And for that, uh, he invoked the ire of the Divine Father. Yeah, yeah. yes. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, that is something where um, I, I, I will not forgive him that. Yeah, I, I know there are people who have a completely different perspective on that. Some tell me, yeah, but... Uh, it was not for making war. It was for humans to defend themselves. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute here. So it, if in the very distant past, we had no need for weapons, then how is that progress? 
how is this the, the the way introducing a way of destruction any progress so it's not mm -mm. right and, and i i think it's important to to point out that all the actions of these various beings whether it's eisenhower whether it's azazel they all have consequences because they also have their own particular allotment of free will and the choices they make have consequences and there is no escaping consequences. So while in the short run, things may appear to be moving in a certain direction over the long run, again, the, uh, the goal is always balance and, and, so it's, it, I want to point this out because I don't want people to think that uh, there are beings out there who are, quote unquote, getting away with it. The, uh, the elite who are carrying out the genocide that is to follow and who have participated very heavily in the uh, oppression of human beings, there are consequences on the horizon for them as well. And I believe that the last harvest begins to point this out and it's something that they don't sit, that doesn't sit well with them i i would say that those who are most angry at me for promoting this book and have an issue with it it's because this particular cat is out of the bag and and a lot of people are very unhappy with this information mm -hmm. so uh yeah. it's it's not just the the average reader on Amazon who reads it and says, wow, this kind of, this isn't cool. I'm going to die. It's those people may be the least upset <laughs> by the yeah. information oh, that's oh. in the book. Yeah, of course not. And um, <clears throat> if somebody wants to annihilate me, I tend to take that personally. <laughs> personally. Right. I, yeah. I... So, um, you said 2025. Uh, Correct. They, they, they will start with the annihilation? Well, 2025 is the year when everything is in place to commence these events. So, for example, one of the vectors of global genocide, and it's not just going to be one vector, it's going to be a combination of vectors. For example, famine combined with viruses, combined with a nuclear conflict under a World War III banner. So let's say with regards to famine, the U.S. Air Force held a symposium in August of 1996 in which a strategic paper on weather control and manipulation was presented titled mm -hmm. Weather as a Force Multiplier Owning the Weather in 2025. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that by 2025, the technology will be ready to put into operation to manipulate weather to the degree that they could create droughts at will, famines at will, weather disasters at will. So again, it's not a coincidence that back in 1996, the target date for deployment was 2025. And we see 2025 coming up over and over in the book, The Last Harvest by Lucy and Mars. Now, some people say, well, is 2025 some sort of occult number is there a blood moon then or no it's just that happens to be the date when the planners of this said we should be ready all of our underground bases will be completely stocked everything will be in place that we can commence with the genocide and be as safe as we'd like to imagine we will be mm. so it's not like you're going to wake up in 2025 and everything's going to be over but we'll probably begin to see for example, World War III, and listen, uh, Putin talks openly. Uh, one can find videos on YouTube where he is openly advocating the use of nuclear warheads should the situation escalate in the Ukraine. And the situation does not look like it's abating in any way, shape, or form anytime soon. And when you have someone like this, and he's talking about nuclear weapons, you say, well, doesn't he have a daughter? Doesn't he wonder what the world will look like after nuclear holocaust? Well, the answer is him and his daughter plan to be in an underground base. So what do they really care what goes on on the surface? It doesn't matter to them. You see in New York City, they run public service announcements on the subways and on the television talking mm -hmm. about what to do in the event of a nuclear strike. So 
The question is, do they know something that the rest of us don't know? I used to live in New York City. I don't live there anymore. Uh, and we have these various vectors. Uh, in the last harvest, we devote five to six pages listing all the scientists who had relationships to age research and bioweapons R&D who have all died under mysterious or unnatural circumstances. That's five to six pages of scientists. So anyone who could have, let's say, had something to do with curing Ebola is no longer here. Seems like maybe could be a coincidence until we realize that there's a University of Texas evolutionary ecologist named Dr. Eric Pianca, who's interestingly or oddly enough named, nicknamed the lizard man, who extols the joys of Ebola with the highest praise saying, AIDS is not an efficient killer. It is too slow. My favorite candidate for guess what? Eliminating 90% of the world's population. There you go again. What's his favorite candidate? Airborne Ebola. And all the scientists who could have had anything to do with curing Ebola, they're all dead in mysterious quote unquote circumstances. So, mm. wow, again and again, we see 90% of the world population being reduced over and over. It's not a coincidence at a certain point. Mm. So when 2025 is that date, uh, what is all the hype about 2030? I'm not familiar with any hype around 2030. I, I know. Oh, well, they're, they're by, by then, you know, uh, electric vehicles and uh, net zero in terms of carbon <laughs> emission. And, uh, right. It, it, so 2030 uh, pops up time and again. And somehow that doesn't make sense to me anymore. No, I mean, they, listen, they can they can say whatever they want. There's all sorts of the Illuminati, the Freemason, the, the Bilderberg group, the uh, uh, those who meet at Davos. They're all under the, the influence of the Nebu Gray and the, the particular reptilians that defected from the Siakar Empire back in the day and joined up with the Nebu Gray. Um, they're all under their influence and they all push various agendas and you can see them on a on a day to day basis, and it, it doesn't really matter what they say. What what matters is what's what's really afoot, and that is this depopulation agenda, which is scheduled to commence in twenty twenty five. So, uh, some people would say, "Well, how long would it take?" It's hard to say exactly, but you could safely say that by twenty fifty, there'll be nobody on this planet. That's just if the planet itself is not also turned into another asteroid belt given what I've said earlier about artificial intelligence. So it won't end well for anyone. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not like the Nebu Gray will successfully wipe out 90% of the world's population and just take over the planet. It's, it, there's all these other alien groups that are looking at it and saying, no, we'd like it ourselves. All the alien extraterrestrial groups out there looking at human beings is just an impediment to the goal of getting the planet. So a lot of people say, oh, well, the Galactic Federation will come and save us. No, why would they save you? The, the issue is what would any extraterrestrial civilization, humanoid or not, do with the population that's on this planet? There's not much they could do with them. Human beings would not successfully assimilate into many of these extraterrestrial societies, some of them will, sh will definitely. And that's another reason it's called the last harvest because various alien groups are looking at the human population and saying which ones here are hybridized and have RH negative blood and which ones would we like to extract and would they fit into our civilization or not? Uh, so they're all scrambling to quote unquote, pull their people out before the- and How uh, would they do that? It's very easy. The, how would they do it? It's, it's as simple as coming and getting you. Because what people don't understand about extraterrestrial technology, and I'll give you an analogy to help explain it to your audience. Let's say that, what's everyone's favorite piece of technology? It's an iPhone. So let's say you have your trusty iPhone 10, or I'm an Android guy, so I don't know what the latest iPhone is. Let's say you had whatever it is. And I were to 
somehow teleport you back in a Doctor Who time machine to the Middle Ages. And you're walking among the peasants and you look at my iPhone and you turn it on. And let's just imagine it worked. I know there's no cellular network there, but they turned it on. What would those people think about this technology? How would they grasp it? It would look to them probably like they'd say, oh, this is witchcraft, or they would burn you at the stake. They wouldn't even know what this is. And this iPhone is, what, a thousand years in the future? If that, the Middle Ages weren't even a thousand years ago, if I'm correct. I'm a little off there, but the point is it's a very brief span of time. And when we look at an extraterrestrial civilization, you have to realize, and a lot of people have trouble grasping this, their technology is over 100 million years more advanced than ours. Mm -hmm. They don't have a problem anymore. They're not sitting around saying, oh, does a soul exist or not? Oh, they, they, they can graft the soul from one biological vehicle to another along with the consciousness. They can teleport people. They can pass through different dimensions because there's more than the third dimension. Many of these extraterrestrials live in all different dimensions. Some live in multiple dimensions, can travel between them. The technology is beyond anything a human mind could grasp. So when people talk about, well, how are human beings abducted and experimented on? It's very simple. They simply teleport you right out of wherever you are, do whatever they want to, teleport you back, wipe out your memories, install fake memories so you don't know what happened. You imagine something else happened than what happened, and you've been modified. And they can do this to you your entire life if they want. And what are you going to do about it? You won't even know half the time it's being done to you. You could be filled with alien implants to track you, to modify your the hybridization and control what's been done to you. And you don't even realize what's going on. So if an extraterrestrial civilization wishes to extract an individual for whatever reason, they can do it. And there's no one who can stop them. And it's there's no place to hide. You can't put yourself into a concrete box and think they can't come in and get you, they can go right through the physical matter and get you. So the, this technology gap between human beings and extraterrestrials is, is so incredible that this is the problem with understanding extraterrestrial technology and understanding how human beings are at effect as opposed to being at cause from these sort of technologies. Mm. So in other words, they would simply beam me up. <laughs> yeah, you could put it that way. That, that, that technology is nothing new. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's lots of ways they can come and get you. I mean, they, they're doing it all the time when they're abducting people. So mm -hmm. <laughs> what's the difference between that and taking you away from here as opposed to returning you after some experimentation? Yeah. There's no oh, difference. Oh, oh. What do you have any insight what exactly determines if somebody gets abducted or not? Yes, the the main factor is the ability to conduct hybridization on that individual. So mm -hmm. as I said earlier, one of the main factors is R, factors is RH negative blood. That doesn't mean that they aren't individuals with RH without RH negative blood who are not abducted, some are and hybridized, but for the most part, as a general rule, you could say it's those who have RH negative blood. And if you're also A negative, in addition to being RH negative, then you're even more in demand. But as a general rule, if someone is RH negative blood, chances are that they have been abducted, hybridized, unless some force of extraterrestrial nature stopped it from happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, and and why? The, what is it exactly about um, Rh negative blood that they might be interested in? Is that like an extraterrestrial marker? Yes. Oh, okay. So, in other words, they would look at that as abducting one of their own. No, they would just look at it as this host is suitable for, oh, okay. for hybridization. Mm -hmm. it, now, that, that, that sometimes it may be one of their own. There's many reasons why uh, I, I could say there it's, of course, they are beings who are not necessarily human, maybe extraterrestrial in nature who 
walk around on the planet and, and look human. So in theory, yeah, they could abduct one of their own. But as a general rule, that's not why they're abducting them. They're abducting them because they wish to conduct hybridization. And this idea of what humans talk about now, it's very popular, human trafficking. The idea of species trafficking goes on throughout the universe where the people are grabbed and they are modified and sold on the open market for various purposes. It's, it's, a, it's a very different universe out there. It's, it's not what necessarily it's what in, human... To me, it's an <laughs> inverted universe. Everything is uh, totally upside down, it, it, especially here, but out there as well. So um, what would be beautiful and loving is uh, being frowned at and uh, anything that is destructive and um, yeah, causes pain and suffering. Uh, everybody is, uh, yeah praising that and doing it. So I look at this universe as an inverted universe. It's it, to me, it feels like a copy of something else. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, Be I... Because um, the, the obsession with destruction, that to me is a dead giveaway that something is very, very wrong here. Are you still there? No, I, I, I'm listening to what, <laughs> what, you're, what you're saying. I, I'm not commenting. I'm just listening. I'm letting you speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah. No, say no, how no. you feel about it. I'm not going to comment on it. I'm just going to listen to you. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, I have a strong feeling we live in an inverted universe completely. And it will be interesting to see how it dissolves all of this. Um, honestly, I'm not, I'm not really afraid. Yeah. When um, I'm not saying they are not going to try. I'm not saying um, that the plan does not exist. What I'm saying is that they will fail. They will not be victorious. And that is simply my intuition. And it is not born out of wishful thinking. Um, plans, even the best plan, can only take you so far. And then you have variables and unforeseen forces and things that you have never considered and things might go very, very wrong. So I do not doubt that that plan exists. I do not doubt that they will try to execute it, but I'm pretty sure they will fail. Well, there, there is a, an expression, the best laid plans of mice and men, which I think backs <laughs> up what you're saying. The only issue here is that these plans were laid neither by mice nor men. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I, you know, a fully developed, and yes, I know we will not be fully developed by 2025, but I'm pretty sure that a fully developed human being, um, if we combine our minds, yeah, and we focus really on that, what we want, yeah, something peaceful, something um, that promotes harmony and, um, you know, cooperation instead of destruction. I'm pretty sure that we can um, stop their ships and turn them into butterflies. Well, unfortunately, the the and people don't have to agree with what I'm about to say. Unfortunately, the the time for human beings to wake up and see what's around them and I mean, the term I'd use would be lobby for a different reality. Yeah, that has, that has passed. People, I know, but you took do their not free will, everybody. and they and they took their free will, and they they 
really didn't use it. So yeah. yeah, yeah, but you don't you don't need everybody for that. You you need uh, a certain amount of um, uh, people who understand what is going on. You don't need ever uh, all eight billion, not not even one billion people for that. So um, I'm pretty relaxed, <laughs> although I find this plan horrifying and disgusting. And yeah, and you know, somehow I'm a little bit uh, disappointed in our so-called space brothers. Um, although I never had any illusions about them because I know that, yeah, warfare is, yeah the thing that, that they are all doing. And, but at least I had hoped yeah, that there is somebody out there that has a totally uh, different view on people and would work for um, something more beneficial. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> My cat was... Uh... Yeah, she's okay. working for something more beneficial. Yeah, <laughs> did you see that? Yes, I did. <laughs> when she put her paw into my face. Okay, so um, yeah, but it doesn't seem to be uh, the case. Um, hence, I'm more and more convinced that we are living in an <laughs> inverted universe, and um, yeah, I, I, somehow I feel sorry for them that they have to sink to such a destructive level in order to uh, achieve their goals and yeah feel and, and on top of it feel good about it it's it's a very sad state of mind i'm done <laughs> <laughs> well yeah no i i i certainly welcome uh people's feedback on the book uh, mm. like i said it's it's uh it's the, the the main the many different reactions are are expected to the book and <laughs> i'm i'm totally open to all listening to any reaction that someone has to it it's mm. uh again it's a it's a dark book mm. and it's what's what's so dark about the book is is really when one looks at all the executive orders, for example, that presidents have signed since Eisenhower going forward, every time a president has left office, they have surreptitiously signed a series of executive orders that at this point, many years later, have culminated into a situation where the US government, for example, can at any time for any reason, declare a state of emergency, martial law, to take away everyone's rights, all their property and put them into FEMA camps and do whatever they want with them. And mm. the last harvest is filled with these laws and facts and they can all be looked up. Nothing really in the latter half of this book are the words of Lucy and Mars. And they're certainly not my words. It's these are the words of our leaders. Uh, those, those who write the laws, those who are the elite who are determining what goes on and I think a lot of people there, they get rather horrified because there was a time some years ago where the topic of FEMA camps, for example, or executive orders signed by presidents was in vogue in the quote unquote conspiracy theory community. Then people kind of forgot about it almost as if, well, maybe they repealed those laws or they don't exist anymore, but that's not the case. It's, yeah, uh, usually when nothing happens, uh, people tend to brush it off. Yes, yes, that's... Uh, yeah, it's definitely and that 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 is kept in store for a later <laughs> date. Um, that does not occur to everybody, but as you just said, they have been hoodwinked as well. Yes, of course, oh, because yeah. the uh, the the hoodwinking is simply that once they've done their job of pulling off this genocide, they're the next ones under the guillotine blade and that is what humans uh, also do you know if you have a really brutal and totalitarian uh takeover in, in a specific country yeah then 
what do they do? They usually eliminate those who, yeah, help them with brutal force to get there. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. That is, it is a standard operating procedure. Mm. And it's not just among humans, as yeah. those in the elite who read The Last Harvest will see. Yeah. So, Damien, is there anything that you would like to add that is um, important <laughs> to understand? Well, I, I, I think that, uh, again, this book is not a prophecy, but rather it's a plan. And people need to listen to what Bill Gates is saying, what Jax Cousteau is saying, what Kissinger is saying. And I understand that a lot of this information is not only very dark, but it's often buried by the endless gossip and entertainment that streams through the web browser and the cell phone. But the reality is you can't hang out on Instagram or make TikTok videos when you're dead. So instead of figuring out how you're going to be the next big influencer, you might want to think about the fact that there's a 90% chance you'll be dead or behind barbed wire in a FEMA camp in the next five to 10 years. And this isn't me saying this again. It's not Lucian saying it. It's the elite saying this, and you can see their words throughout the pages of, of The Last Harvest. And for those who perhaps may not care about that or may not find it interesting, or perhaps they have just resigned themselves to the fact that they were going to die anyway sooner or later, so what's the big deal if they die a little bit earlier? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't read the book because there's something in this book for everyone, for those who are very interested in conspiracy theories or alternative history, and they want to know how everything ties together and of all the information they've consumed, what is real and what is false. Again, The Last Harvest is, is the book to go to because it's not only so filled with information about the galactic history that we are a result of, but this information has never been found anywhere else in any book or source on this planet. Most of the information about reptilians is recycled from the opinions of David Icke or the information that was relayed to a Native American by the name of Robert Morning Sky, who received a lot of information from a downed alien pilot who had a lot of information about the history of our galaxy on a crystal hard drive. And a lot of that information is corrupted and is not correct and is recycled over and over. And so if one is looking for a book that finally explains everything that one would need to know about the history of this galaxy and the planet and how human beings came to be and how things ended up the way they are today, then The Last Harvest is, is certainly the book for them. Uh, Certainly anyone who is a fan of Star Wars, for example, would want to know where George Lucas got the idea of a Death Star. Where did he get the idea of a lightsaber? Well, The Last Harvest points out that the Death Star is an actual spacecraft that is used by the reptilian Siakar Empire. And it can, in fact, wipe out planets the way the Death Star does. And it goes into detail explaining this. George Lucas was an insider who knew a thing or two about the history of our galaxy and lightsabers are almost primitive weapon that is that has been in existence for a long time i know people are obsessed with that who watch science fiction but if you want to know more about it it's in there too that certainly is not the the reason the book was written it's not the main focus of the book and it's not what's most important in the book what's most mm -hmm. important is what is going to happen to human beings which is this global genocide set to commence in 2025 and what's important is that one is aware of this information and the hows and whys, and then what they do with that information and how they process it, that is up to them. And again, it's a dark book. There's no happy ending. There's no takeaway. There's no, oh, do this or follow this religion or do this yoga practice or lobby your congressman. There's nothing in there. It is almost as if you are served a notice that you are on death row, regardless of whether or not you've committed crimes to end up there, but you find yourself on death row. What do you do? That is effectively what the book is presenting to people. And I know it's very dark, but there's no way that someone will not read this book and not get a lot out of it. They will certainly be getting information they've never encountered before. And while 
People may wish to discount everything that is in the realm of speculation when it comes to aliens or the galactic history of this planet. The one thing they can't discount is all of the quotes from our leaders. They cannot discount the fact, for example, that I can go on Amazon right now and purchase a U.S. Army field manual that goes into great detail about exactly how concentration camps in the United States will be run. So mm -hmm. this book is published by the U.S. government, by our military. It is telling you they're not trying to hide it anymore. They don't care about hiding it. They're so far advanced in their plan, they're ready to execute it. So they have no problem telling you all about it. So mm -hmm. that is something that can't be refuted. One can, of okay. course, put their heads in the sand like an ostrich does, but that again is their free will if they choose to do that with their head. Hmm. Uh, by the way, I read uh, on a website that did a review hmm. on this book that Lucia worked with a reptilian archivist. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Lucian Mars is part of the Siakar Empire. And oh, okay. he has access to this information that is contained in something called the Gurku Chronicle. And it is a, a historical document, for lack of to put it in human terms, which is contained upon what is called a maystone or a crystal, which is, uh, and maystones are a type of crystal that are only available on certain planets in, in, in the uh, galaxy. And these crystals are used for, to store information, to be used in weaponry systems. Uh, they're a very valuable natural resource that's out there in, in the galaxy. And so Lucy and Mars had access to one of these uh, chronicles and a lot of this information was pulled from those chronicles. And this is very similar to Robert Morning Sky, who the, got a lot of his information from a downed alien pilot because he had a similar type of technological device on his craft that contained information that runs in parallel to a lot of the information that would be in The Last Harvest. Another example would be there was a, a writer by the name of Anton Parks who claimed to also channel some of information from the Goku Chronicle. The problem with Robert Anton Park's work is that he delusionally believed himself to be Enki, not even realizing that Enki is Lucifer, and then went on to tell some very off-base stories about the creation of Enlil at the hands of Enki, which is absolutely ridiculous. So mm -hmm. a lot of Anton Park's information can be thrown into the rubbish bin where it belongs. The only interesting aspect of what Robert Anton Parks wrote was the fact that he was capable somehow of channeling this information, even though it came out very garbled and subject to his own interpretive distortions. So some people will read The Last Harvest and say, oh, well, this sounds like something Anton Park said before. It's nothing like Anton Park said. Mm -hmm. Anton Parks is not even worth quoting because it's so far off base, whereas the works of Robert Morning Sky, they can be quoted and referenced because there is a certain amount of, of fact to a certain amount of that information. And the rest is cleared up by Lucy and Mars where he explains mm -hmm. what happened because he has access to a better source of the data than did Morning Sky. Mm. Um, Morning Sky, isn't that the Terra Papers? Morning Sky was a Native American who... Uh... Yeah, I, I know, but oh. didn't, didn't didn't he um, uh, publish or... And I found it uh, on the internet, um, uh, the Terra Papers. I think that uh, stems from uh, Robert Morning Sky. It, it may. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. You know more um, than me in that regard. Yeah, but... you, you will find it on script. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, as far as channeled information goes, I stay away from it. Always. Always. Because most people have no fucking clue whom they are really uh, in, in contact with. That is a very good observation. A, mm -hmm. a lot of people, not only do they have no idea who is feeding them the information, but this applies to many other, how should I say, magical workings where people get involved with 
whatever occult activities they get involved with, they don't know who it is they're actually interacting with necessarily. And yeah. it's problematic. And the same thing is with channeling that people are not sure, just like certain individuals don't realize when they are praying to Yahweh that they are praying to the dead Prince Enlil, mm. who is long gone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that, is, that is one of the hardest pills to swallow. Concentration camps and genocide aside, <laughs> I guess that, that is still one of the uh, hardest pills to swallow. Mm -hmm. and, and it is simply because all these uh, so-called gods have been portrayed in a way and we have been conditioned to believe this and this is the be all end all yeah and uh, yeah things will get uh, very tough but then here comes the savior and everything will be good right i i mean, I mean there are many quote unquote gods and goddesses in creation but they were all put into creation by the divine father and and mm -hmm. And uh, that so one 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 there's in some ways there is no conflict between the like when people talk about and I don't want to obviously open up a religious can of worms so when people talk about this idea of monotheism and polytheism which is a, a human argument that or debate that I'm not interested in the fact mm. remains that they are beings out there who would be classified as gods or goddesses but they are not the divine father so in fact all of these realities are existing at once it's not a question all is there one god or multiple gods well there is the divine father who created it all and then of course there are beings that he created that one could classify or does classify as gods or goddesses but they're certainly not replacements for the divine father mm, yeah so wow maybe we have to let that one sink in <laughs> 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 and uh, but I thank you very much for coming. You have confirmed a lot of my biases <laughs> <laughs> that I had. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I had uh, wasn't my intention, but if that's what happened, that's what happened. Yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it happened <laughs> because um, I'm. I'm one. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm the only one. Of course not, but. The group that is looking at ETs very critical and uh, not so, oh, yeah, our space brothers, yeah, yay, they're coming. Um, mm -mm. And I haven't been that way for a long time. And yeah, you probably, you did confirm it for me. Yeah. Yeah, those who are coming are not coming to help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is true. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, thank you again. And uh, I hope we will talk in the future. Yes. And uh, so that was it, guys. Night flight for today, a little bit darker than usual. <laughs> and uh, stay safe and sound out there. We are going to make it. Bye-bye. <laughs> and now I need to find the button.